Morgan, thank you so much for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me again. I am just so grateful for the chance to chat with you again. It's always such a joy. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That means so much to me. You are such a special, special soul. Um, So you have been on this journey putting authentic, beautiful, honest things in the world. And Mm. I've been so here for it as so many of us have been. And recently you wrote yet another book and it just came out uh, less than a month ago. So let's talk about this book. Peace is a practice, an invitation to breathe deep and find a new rhythm for life. What inspired you to want to write this book? Yeah. So about a year ago, I almost exactly a year ago, I was diagnosed with autism. And that was, it was something that was in process for a while. And it was, it just so happened to be that I I was in the season where I I was able to work with the publisher and was like, okay, we're writing a book. And I kind of had some ideas, but, you know, I was just a little bit like, okay, you know, what do you even write about, especially in these times? What could I possibly say? And before I even really started diving into it, I ended up seeing some TikTok videos of some women who had been diagnosed with autism as adults and just hearing them share their stories. It just really made so many things make sense in my life. And I went from that to being able to find a specialist in my area to a year ago when Mm -hmm. I received, um, the official diagnosis. And it was when I received that she was kind of reading the list of, you know, everything, a part of the diagnosis. I also have a sensory processing disorder. I have a lot of issues with executive, executive functioning and just a lot of things that I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. But it was also very heavy. Yeah. And she ended it saying, and it's not your fault. And I just took like the biggest exhale and I just cried. (laughs) Um, I just cried and I just couldn't even, I can't, it's still trying to find the words to describe what that felt like to finally know that what you struggled with has a name. And that to me just gave me so much peace. I walked out of there saying I'm autistic and this is who I am. And Yes, there are struggles with it. And there's also strengths and beauty that come with that as well. And I'm really grateful. And it sent me into this thing where in my life where I started to just reflect on all the ways that even though I didn't know that I was autistic, I had been practicing learning how to pace myself through every season of life. I have been learning how to extend grace to myself and to not be so hard on myself and to to still find joy in the little things, all these things that bring me peace. And that is what empowered me to write, to write the book, because I was like, you know what? I think there's a lot of other people out there who just have not been giving themselves enough credit. And I want to invite other people on this journey of finding even more rhythms to, to just breathe deep in our daily life. Cause we've already been on the journey. We've already been through hard stuff and we've already been learning how to inhale and exhale through every moment. And I just wanted to to create a space in the form of a book of like, hey, we're already in this together. How can we just continue to practice what it means to find peace in daily life? So that's oh kind of how, how the book came to life. Wow, that is so powerful. So vulnerable, but very like you to share something both powerful and vulnerable. That's kind of your thing. Uh, (laughs) And that line of, you know, she turning to you and saying, it's not your fault. That totally immediately, immediately brought tears to my eyes, Mm. probably because on a visceral level, we all need to hear that line. Mm -hmm. Like it's Mm -hmm. not your fault. Um, That was really, really healing for you to share that. And so beautiful that she gave you that that compassion, that permission, that truth. And, and you're right. Martha Beck was actually here with us yesterday in this community. And she was talking about rest Mm -hmm. and how 
that is also something to do, to put on your to-do list is the resting. Mm. And when people say, I don't really know what my purpose is or what I want, she was like, how about try resting? Like, it's like, mm, we just yeah. forget that peace should be on the to-do list, that mm -hmm. that is our address and we mm -hmm. don't live there ever. So let's get into it more. Let's talk about how you cultivate peace in your daily life. What are some of the practices mm -hmm. and what are some of the ways that you can tolerate it? Because mm. very often we're so addicted to being in this sort of fast paced energy that it actually feels uncomfortable mm -hmm. to sit in peace. Yes, absolutely. So I realized early on, I didn't have the language for it until a couple of years ago, but I realized early on that moving my hands is something that grounds me so much. And when I say moving my hands, like, I don't mean like doing like, a, I can't even, I don't know why this is the first image that came in my head. What's that thing where you, um, needlework, where you have like the, the yeah. wooden thing and the, <laughs> it's a great, terrible job explaining this. I don't mean like, <laughs> oh, a precise activity where I'm like, you know, super focused, just literally moving my hands, cross stitch, a cross stitch. I, I, I cheated. Someone left a comment and it popped up. Thank you. That was, <laughs> I was like, oh gosh, this is going to be on my mind all day that I cannot think of that word. So yeah, I don't necessarily mean like moving my hands like something super specific and, um, you know, like finite and focused all the time. I just mean moving my hands. So as a kid, what that looked like was I used to, um, I used to take loose leaf paper and I would just write stories all the time. Like I would just all the time, like anybody that knew me as a kid, I would just sit there and I would just write and write and write and write. And I know now why I was doing that because it was helping me regulate. It was helping me self-regulate, just moving my hand. I didn't know I was autistic as a kid, but I can look back and I know very clearly that that's what that was. That's what I was doing. So I had bound uh, binders and binders worth of just loosely paper, um, stories that I would write that a lot of times didn't even make sense or I would rewrite stories and it was literally moving my hands and one thing that I've noticed as somebody who is um you know I'm, I'm 32 so I grew up as I grew up technology became more prevalent like it was in probably maybe middle school I remember hearing about dial-up internet and from the time I went away to college, like having a cell phone to graduating from college to getting an iPhone and all those things slowly, but surely moving my hand in day-to-day -day life, just writing notes, doodling was taken away. It was mostly just taken away. So just that simple activity of helping me just slow down when I'm feeling the overload, because for me, something as simple as fluorescent lights can just gradually wear me down mm -hmm. as the day goes on. So I just need something even now, just even doing this, like this helps <laughs> even as we're talking. So, you know, when I, I started to notice, I was like, wait a second, as more technology comes along, I'm doing less of moving my hand. And it's, it's even though typing is technically, you know, so moving your fingers, it's just not the same. So when I was 27 or 26, actually, that's when I, I saved up and I got an iPad and that's where I started to do the art that, that leads to what I do today. And it was so fascinating because back then I, there were no, there was no like digital art community of like, I, I was just doing it. I'm like, I don't know why, but in this stressful time in my life where I'm in my mid twenties and me and my husband are living in this one bedroom apartment, just trying to struggle and make things happen. This thing is bringing me peace. I'm like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but it's helping me in this moment. So I would say that that is a, that is a practice. I, and I talk about it in the book as well, but I just talk about this concept of like, as the world gets more, 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 more complicated, a lot of times it's those yeah. simple practices that can help ground us even more. So I think that I, I and probably others have gone through this, you know, like experience of, okay, well, what does self-care look like or whatever? And it's like, a lot of times they end up 
it can become complicated, you know, when we think about what we may actually want to do. It's like, well, what I actually need is a month long vacation at this beach with the weather being this way right, and, right. These things, and these things taken care of before I go. So, you know, there's a lot of steps required to that, but it's like, yes, we can aim for that. And I want, I want everybody to have that moment. And at the same time, what can we do every day that just helps us breathe to help us slow down and release the tension from our body. So that's one of the main ones that's very simple, but it's huge in my life. And I'm so grateful because even now I I have a two-year-old and I don't get to like make as much art and (laughs) do as much things as as I used to. But one of the things that's so fascinating is I still have time to move my hand every day, even with him, because I'm showing him how to color. I'm showing him how to work with paint. So every day I'm still getting to do that and I'm so grateful because it, it really does make a huge difference. Mm, it's so cool the way you describe the whole thing. And I'm just struck by two things. One, how you're right that I feel like most of the time when everyone is not busy doing something, they're, we're just scrolling our phones, right? Which it kind of lulls the brain to sleep. And after a while, I'm not sure it's really doing anything great for us. I think studies have proven that. Um, the other thing that's really striking, and I want to just call back to it in case we, we had you here on, on the podcast a couple of years ago, but in case people don't know the story, that is so beautiful that the thing that was bringing you peace, it led to literally an empire. Like it's magnificent. Like there was no... Cr- person who came to career day, you know, the, the fire, per, the firefighter, and there was the veterinarian. There was no person who came and said, I make authentic artwork with poetry, um, digitally. And then I wind up licensing it, licensing it to yeah. all the places and writing books and building a huge community. You too can do that. Yeah. <laughs> like that exactly. wasn't modeled for you, mm-hmm. but you, you split the sea. You, 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 you showed up and then the path appeared. Let's mm-hmm. talk about that journey because it's so inspiring and it's healed so many people. What was that like for you to start putting things out there and then to see how big of a response that got? It was very encouraging. <laughs> very, very encouraging. Encouraged me to keep going because prior to when I started to share my digital artwork and poetry, nearly everything that I had done before was something that drained me of energy a lot faster. So I had like a whole career where I was trying to be, uh, I shouldn't say trying, I did it. I did for five years. I was a touring musician. (laughs) I say trying because it does not pay very well. It's like, it's like, you're like, oh my gosh, my schedule is very full, but the bank account is not. Um, so it's a very um, taxing, it was a very taxing experience. So I had like a lot of internal struggle with like, oh my goodness, I enjoy doing this, but it does drain me. And also the financial part isn't there as well. So it made, it was just a lot of inner conflict of like, whoa, how do you even do this? So in many ways, What I did prior to what I'm doing now were different variations of that. They were things that just took a lot of energy. I, I, at one point was a wedding photographer and I I was like, oh my goodness, my favorite part of the whole thing was like hearing the story of the couple. And it was, it was, um, and then my next favorite part thing was putting together their album, the the wedding itself, which is like, oh, it was, it was not, not something I could sustain for a long time. And I literally remember doing, it was the the proudest wedding I did in terms of the way the the photography came out. And I remember being in the, in the motel (laughs) with my husband after and just laying in the bed the next morning. And I just physically could not move. I physically could not move. And I was like, okay, how, and I remember I got paid $800 for that. And I was just like, wow, I got paid $800. Awesome. Like back then that was just like, I was like, (laughs) I had never been paid like $800 to do like one thing like that. I was like, whoa, oh my goodness. But I could not move. Mm -hmm. So it was like, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, what am I supposed to do? So what I ended up finding with the digital art 
and poetry in the way that I share it now was that even though I'm not going to lie, when I first started sharing it, it did feel like less than the things I had done before. Because when I was in music, I was able to travel with artists playing big festivals and big arenas. I, I've done some cool stuff. So to come from that and you know doing big weddings to, to making art on my iPad and putting it on Instagram, it felt like a reduced version yeah. of of what I felt like I was capable of. Um, so I did deal with that for a while, but sort of the silver lining in it was that this gives me energy. When I am able to share art and see people commenting and leaving messages, I was able to respond with, with joy. And, and I was so happy to be present with the people who are interacting with what I was doing. So that is what sustained it. And I, and I think that what sustain ended up sustaining it is like, that's what helped me create consistency around my work that I was able to, and I, I still do just put out a lot of original content all the time to the point that every time, like I've, I've had opportunities with Target, Anthropology, like they're referencing stuff that's on my Instagram. Like that's, those are the things that are in the briefs and that just comes from being consistent, but I would not have been able to be consistent at something that didn't energize me, (laughs) that if it, if it drained me, I couldn't do it. Like, and one thing I always encourage people like, oh my gosh, but how do you do so much? I'm like, a lot of people are not paying attention to what I don't do. For instance, one, there's a very specific example, being on an Instagram story and showing my face takes a lot of energy. So I don't do it. I don't do it every now, every now and then I do, but I I rarely ever do. If you see a video of me as an Instagram reel, please know that is take number 100. And I took like an hour break after that. Like that's not, I just, I don't do it all the time. Like I I do it. For instance, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And yesterday I just happened to have my hair combed and had a little bit more energy than normal. And I was just like, I'm going to speak to this moment and here's what I have to say, but I don't have to do it again today. (laughs) You know, I did it one time. So I think that's another important part too. It's like, you have to notice what energizes you and what drains you and try to minimize that as much as possible. Like we can't reduce it completely, but it's like, if as much as you're able to, and I, and I think that that's honestly, what's been able to sustain me staying out there and the opportunities have come from that. Mm. And so many opportunities have come. And I love that you are now a model for so many people of something that can be authentic and also on your terms. Mm-hmm. Like what yeah. you were just saying is like, you can feel that in the energetic of, of your brand and who you are. It's like, this is who she is. This is on her terms. Yeah. I remember walking just a few months ago I was in Santa Monica, we we're walking on Montana and we walked into Splendid. I was going to get a gift for a friend for her birthday. I'm like picking out this like long sweater, cat, whatever, beautiful material. And I walk over to this other display and I'm like, I just burst into tears. I was like, this is Morgan's work. I like could cry. Like thing. I was like, oh my goodness, yes. I was like, she's here. Like, <laughs> and it's so beautiful. And I was like, oh, and how smart that the people who chose, you know, whoever's the buyer at Splendid was like, your presence matters here. Yeah. That's a good mm-hmm. t-shirt. You know, all the, and so we, we bought, I have three little girls, so they each got the Morgan Harper oh Nichols my set. Goodness. They didn't oh. have it in my size, but then I sent away for it. We bought like three sweatshirts for me, and then I sent a bunch of them oh, to my audience. Oh wow, that's amazing! I did not know that. That's awesome. So I've literally given away. I've bought like probably twenty of those sweatshirts and given them away. And they'll, anyway, <laughs> the the point is, uh, you're incredibly uh, gifted and honest, and I want to talk about this because as Rumi says, what you seek is seeking you. And it's, Mm -hmm. it it really is easy to find evidence of anything. And you can find evidence of people in the world who are successful all day long, and they're not doing something that you feel has integrity. Of course, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can also find evidence of people in the world who haven't had to make a choice between getting paid really well and doing something that really is truly an extension of their highest expression. And there you are. When I think of an example of that, you're, you're at the top of my list and you inspire me, you truly inspire me and raise me. And so I want to talk about that 
that place where you are willing to, to take what is the most honest expression and put it in the world. And one of my favorite quotes of yours, I actually quoted you in my book um, at the beginning of one of the chapters. It's like, this is the season she, she doesn't make perfect things, but honest things like, right. So can we talk about that and what that, what that process is like, and maybe one little piece of guidance to help us find our way to, to giving ourselves that space and the grace and the permission to, to make the things that are not perfect or not what everyone needs, but the most honest, honest things that we can make. Yes. Yes. I'm so grateful that you asked that. And, and thanks so much for supporting my, my art in the world that that's so you're so supportive. (laughs) I'm so, so grateful. And, um, you know, honestly, it's, it's honesty. (laughs) That's a huge word for me. Um, and, and I think that honesty is important with anything that we do. And I think that what helps me be the most honest self is when I am whatever I'm making, whatever I'm sharing, I am talking to one person at a time. Yeah. So I think what happens when we are talking to one person at a time there's a mirroring that happens or uh, there's, there's a, a reflection that happens just because by two human beings, just talking to each other, we have that in common for two humans standing across from each other. You know, it's not like a human and a bear. It's like a human and human. <laughs> and it's like, that's the thing, you know, it's just like, and this is all of our differences. It's like, at the end of the day, we're human beings who, who are, who are breathing and we're standing in front of each other, whether virtually or, you know, in person. So with everything I make, I had actually had an opportunity yesterday. I had a, a young, young woman walk up to me and, and she was just sharing with me that my work had just impacted her. And she said, I am a freshman in college and your her, her, I think she said her mom had gifted my book to her. And she told me the book it was, and it was my book, All When We Are Blooming. And I said, you want to know something really interesting? She said that that book has just been really helping her as a freshman in college. And I told her, I was like, you know, what's really interesting about that book. I said, so many of those poems in that book, I close my eyes and I imagine myself, what did I need to hear as a freshman in college? What did I need to hear? What words need to be on these page for freshman in college, Morgan, who was struggling and going through a hard time and felt very alone. And I even thought about the little details of like, okay, a poetry book is, 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 is perhaps good for someone who is under a lot of press pressure and stress in college. Like they already have a lot of books to read. So maybe they don't have like a, you know, time to like sit down and add another book that they read from, you know, beginning to end. But I was like, I want to write this book in a way that this person could open it up and they could just read one part of it and still get something out of it. So it was such a moment of like, oh, you're the person I was writing for. I'm like, I didn't actually literally know you, but it was something, it it was that part of me that ended up connecting with that part of you. It's like, that's what we have in common. And I know nothing more about her life story. I don't, I know nothing more than that. But what I do know is that for one moment in time and all of this, we had this in common and I wrote to that. And that's what I do with everything. And sometimes, and I would say even more (laughs) these days, a lot of times that person is to myself. I'm writing to myself and not always my real time self, but sometimes my future self or my younger self or my year ago self. And what I do to kind of get there is I really focus on the images. So going back to the, I go back to that college freshman thing all the time. And I think about where my bed was. It was against the wall. And it was such a odd shaped room. So I'm like, like in my bed, I'd be laying against the wall. And what I see in front of me is <laughs> my roommate laid the other way. So our beds weren't like next to each other. So when I'm go- when I go to sleep every night looking ahead, <laughs> which is like my roommate sleeping in her bed. And I remember, I was just like, oh, it's just so weird, you know, just going to sleep, like looking at this other person. And <laughs> I'm like, that is weird. <laughs> and there'll be all these times where I was like trying not to make awkward eye contact with her. And it was just so weird. So what I would do is I would turn to the wall just to avoid, you know, the awkward eye contact while we're trying to go to sleep. And um, 
<laughs> Sorry, I just, it's still just so funny to me. But I, so I would turn to the wall and it was on that wall. There was nothing there. Like I, I missed the memo of like, oh, when girls go to college, they bring all this cute art and stuff on the wall. I didn't do that. Um, I didn't have anything. I was like, mom, we're supposed to buy art for the wall. And like people had like whole collages of like all their friends. From yeah, high sure. I didn't have that many friends. So I was like, <laughs> I got I nothing. <laughs> I was like, I was not prepared. So I had nothing on my wall. And I think about that moment, like what could have been on that wall? What could have been on that wall for the girl who didn't bring the art with her and the collage with all her high school friends and the prom pictures and all that stuff? What was on that wall? So that's what I do. I sit down and I paint and when I'm getting, and I'm like, okay, I know I need to paint something to get, I think about that wall. I don't try to imagine every other wall. I'm like that particular wall, when I'm turning over to it, what could have been on that wall? So I think that's what helps me get to that, that honest place on a regular basis. Mm, it's so beautiful. And I love that you said writing for one person. And, you know, it's like when everybody zigs, you, you zag, right. And it's mm -hmm. like, people are obsessed, um, with how many followers they have. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, yeah. we used to live in a time where other things were the litmus test of how cool of a human you are. And now it's like, how many followers do you have? <laughs> and, um, just so everybody's clear, even though Morgan said she had done really cool things like touring arenas and, and and everything else she did when she started this particular part of her life, this endeavor, she didn't have millions of followers. She didn't mm -hmm. have, I think you told me last time you had like a normal, like a thousand people like in yeah. your life, right? Like most people have like their little network. That was it. And I have seen, you know, just through the course of interviewing, like today, Deepak Chopra's episode aired and we just talked about abundance and he was making the correlation. And I want to just point it out between peace, a practice of peace, which is literally the title of your book almost, and expansion. Mm. And so it's like, I want to talk about this a little more because typically people would think like, okay, so Morgan, what was your strategy? Because you did yeah. wind up having <laughs> millions of followers and you got on all the things. So what hashtags did you use? And you're going to be like, mm, I don't think that was it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking just knowing yeah, you. I also bit. literally never use hashtags by the way. So, <laughs> right. So how can we put it together? Let's talk a little bit about what you, what you do think what made sort of, I use this expression a lot, like an atom bomb of, mm -hmm. of energy that went off that, that drew people towards you. What do you think it actually is and was more than quote unquote, like the steps to online marketing and strategy. Oh, yes. You know, I really think it's the, it's thinking of it in terms of person to person, because what ends up happening is the more specific I get, the more I write to one person, what that does is it sends a signal to other people, even if it's not them of someone else in their life who that might relate to. So what ends up happening is, is people want to share that. And that is what has made it grow. It's because I ended up making something that people want to share with someone else. And I think that that happens because what, sometimes I think it's hard for us as humans to always know maybe what we need in real time, but we have other people in our life or we see other people in the world and we can kind of zoom out and say, okay, well, we all need to be reminded to breathe or we all need yeah. to be reminded that in, in uncertain times, like we can find peace. So even if it's not necessarily relate, feeling like it's related to them in that moment, it's something, it, it can still turn into something that they want to share because it's a message that they believe in. And they may, they may want, you know, maybe their younger cousin to hear this, but maybe they don't want to text it to them, but they can put it on their Instagram story and, and it's seen by other people. So I really do think that that is what it has been. I noticed, cause I, I asked people, like when I started getting, when I started getting, um, more followers. I, I was honestly just really shocked. I was like, where are y'all coming from? <laughs> so <laughs> I yeah. started to, to ask people, I'm like, how did you find out about 
me and my work? And I got two answers. Mostly it's almost like literally almost always these two. One was Pinterest. And a lot of people said they were searching for something on Pinterest and my work came up. Now here's a little caveat about that. That's really cool. I am not a Pinterest expert. I do not have a Pinterest strategy, but what happened was is when I started sharing my art, I guess I was just so happy that people were like, oh my gosh, like if somebody likes it, you can have it. I would encourage you. I'm like, you could share my work. You can share it. You can share it. So there's actually this one user I've tried to find them. I can't actually find their real name who has literally been sharing every single one of my Instagram stories on their page for years. So a lot of times when people are actually finding myself on Pinterest, it's not actually me that's posted it. I just told people, you're free to share it. I'm, I'm okay with that. So it's, so a lot of the stuff that shows up on Pinterest up and we've, we've kind of started to share more from my account, but for a long time, I wasn't even sharing it. It was just other people sharing it for, for me, or just because they liked it themselves and wanted to share it. And I was always just okay with that. So that was the first thing, Pinterest. Lots of people came to Instagram from Pinterest. Um, and then the second one, and this is the biggest one is someone told me about what you're doing. Yep. Someone told me that's it. Like, and a million, like some, my, my friend texted it to me. Someone DM'd it to me. My friend tagged me in this word of mouth. That was, <laughs> that was it. And I, I really do think that the way I was able to do that was just, I made it as specific as I could thinking of one person, but what ends up happening is, is like, when you get so specific, it becomes universal. It does expand. It does grow because that person, when you're specific, I think this also happens too, is that, and I think this is a little, little bit more nuanced, but also there, when the more specific you are and the more kind of just honest and present you are about speaking to this thing. And I think this is why a lot of stuff goes viral is people can sense when they're not being marketed to. Yeah. Totally. They can sense when someone's being human with them. They can sense like this person is sharing where they are in this moment. Yeah. in a genuine place. And it's very clear that they're not trying to reach everybody because it's this very specific thing. Like people can tell when things aren't authentic. <laughs> like they can tell when it's like, okay, this is just put out here. So a bunch of people will see it or it'll just get a quick reaction. The stuff that ends up getting shared and spread oftentimes, and you know, sometimes you can manufacture it, but it's not sustainable. The people that do that, they, they won't be able to do it for a decade. <laughs> like they may get some things here and there, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, even when you look at things like reality TV, like I, I don't watch a lot of reality TV, but I'm very intrigued by, you know, loyal following that a lot of reality TV shows have. But in the time that I have watched, I'm like, you know, yes, these shows are produced and they're staged, but, you know, and, and I've actually been a part of a reality show. So I can say like, it's, it's like, yeah, there's, there's producers, there's cameras. Like I wasn't given a script, but I, you know, it's, it's a show. It is a yeah. show at the end of the day. Um, but on the reality show that I was, it's called, um, it's called relative race is you're racing around the country to find your relatives way back in the day. That was fun. And, but on that show, there is an episode where I'm crying on there. And, um, those tears were real. <laughs> those tears were real. I wasn't crying tears for, for, for views. I was crying real tears. I had just received like on the show I had received, um, they had found my great, great grandfather who had been born a slave and it died free. And my sister and I, we just sat there bawling our eyes out. And I was like, that was real. That was real. I was not doing like, yes, I had a mic pack on me and there's a camera in my face, but everything about that moment was real. And I think that that's ultimately what people end up connecting with. They connect with that realness and people we're, we're human and we can sense it in other humans. We can sense that realness. So I really do think that's what it is. That is so beautiful. Thank you for bringing that in. You know, it's interesting, especially speaking about that topic, that one of the things that's always struck me, and I, I tell this story every year on 
Martin Luther King Day, but I, I love this, this anecdote that I had heard, which is that he, it, he had practiced his, the most famous speech of all. He had practiced it a million times. It's hanging in the Smithsonian. He knew every word. And then he got on stage and I'm sure you know this story, but he got on stage and this woman who was in the choir, she said, Martin, tell them about your dream. And he said, I have a dream. And that was not on the page. Um, he didn't rehearse that part. So it's interesting that that's the part that everybody knows because it was so vulnerable. It was so in the moment. And it like, you know, it got like a lump in his throat because it was just completely honest in that very second that she said, tell them about that. And to have a dream, you know, it's like you could have all the theory, you could have all the, the, the proof, but for one human to stand up in front of other humans and say, you know, I actually just have a dream, you know, like mm -hmm. this is just like, it's so beautiful and your work resonates like that, you know, mm. it's so powerful. And one of the things I also want to say, because I'm very into like the, you know, God and <laughs> infinity and reality with a capital R is that whenever I see someone having success, right? I, I know on some level that you're allowing it, that you're not resistant to it. Mm. And I bring this up because wow. so often people will post something, right? And it mm -hmm. is beautiful mm -hmm. and it is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And then when I dig into it with this person, let's say we have a moment to kind of talk about it, a friend of mine, let's say, there is tremendous resistance mm -hmm. to being seen to having an audience, like all these things, right? And it, it's in the field, like it comes in, right? And, and then I ask, I, I'm curious what you think because people will make these sweeping judgments, right? Like we were talking before about the phone and how it's not particularly the healthiest place to be. Mm -hmm. it, it also doesn't mean that the 4 billion people on social media yeah. to say, social media is evil. It's like, that's 4 billion humans. Like that yeah. makes no sense, right? Yeah. So clearly, you are a match, not for the resistance and the yucky aspects, which are all throughout the world and everything and in any plane, yeah. but you're a match for expansion, right? You, you go mm. beyond it into the atmosphere of like the connection. And when you even said before something that no, we've done 600 episodes, nobody has said this part. When you said, I just want everybody to share my work. It's like, please share it. <laughs> there was no like, don't share it. And if you do share it, share yeah. it like this and blah, 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 blah. Like there's the ego is like released mm -hmm. into the atmosphere. Yeah. So it's almost like, therefore you're not a match for ego when it comes in like trolls or that you're like not a match. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. no Velcro oh, for any of it. That is so true. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Oh, and I love that. I love that. <laughs> and I love what you said about the match because I think that that is that is what's happening. And I, what I feel like my favorite part is like, it was an accident. Like it started with me just being like, uh, just like, like a giddy artistic, autistic <laughs> millennial who just like, Oh my gosh, somebody liked something that I did. Oh, right. you can share. Like I was so honestly, I was so heartbroken when I had spent all that time in music and a lot of money and moved to a different state and did all these things. And I just didn't see the fruit. And it was so heartbreaking because I, at, the, at that particular time, I was in an industry where being a black person, I was a minority. And some of the things that I was told during that time, they just crushed me. And they just made me feel like, oh, if they're only going to let black people in, they're only going to let in so many. And I have my, my literal sister is, is in the same city. So we, and we joke about it all the time. We're like, well, guess they picked you uh, <laughs> and they'll let me tag along sometimes. So it was very heartbreaking. And I think what ended up happening was I'm like, when I get this chance to finally share and people want to listen, I just want to give them permission to run with it, take it, own it. It's yours now, like bring it into your life. If it speaks to you, you can have it. And even now, as I'm talking, I'm like, my hands are open. Yeah, and I, I, I think that. that's, I think that's, that's, that's a part of it. I'm just like this part of my life, this part of who I am, this energizes me. And 
I just want, I want you to have things like that in your life as well. So if this reminds you to keep seeking out that little thing that just brings you joy, then take it, run with it. Like, let that, let that be the reminder. And I, I, I've had so many people, I think all the, I've had, I've had people be that for me. I've had people be that for me. And I I don't mean to put you on the spot, but your podcast (laughs) is one of those, like that I was turning to. And I'm like, yeah, you don't have to share what you share, but you do. And you're generous with it. And we're like, yes, thank thank you. you. That's, that's fuel for me to keep that going in the world. So I just, I love that. And I feel like it's, it's, I th- you know, not all artists are ca- or people are able to share in the same capacity. We all have different capacities that we can share. But I do think that it's very important for, for an artist or creative or some, an entrepreneur or someone who's starting something to find some part of what you do that you can just be like radically generous about. And you can just like go all in and just say, this is from my overflow. Like, I'm just so excited to, to share, you know, share this with you. Like, another like personality difference. My mom does that with, my mom is a people person. I'm a people person, but my energy goes, my battery drains faster (laughs) than hers. My mom could just, I mean, I'm like, how are you still on like a hundred percent right now? I don't understand. (laughs) She can just talk everywhere. She's one of those people. I mean, she's making friends with everybody in line at the grocery store. Like every, like I was literally driving with her and she was, and she didn't, I was driving her and she didn't know where we were. She's like, oh, I think that's the TJ Maxx where, you know, Sandra works there. And I'm like, mom, I'm who's like, Sandra? And she's like, oh no, Sandra's a manager. She's the best. And I'm just like, how do you have time to meet all these people? So she's just, <laughs> she's just one of those people. If I go in the store with her, I go the other, cause I'm like, she ha- like she, she, make, she makes, makes friends everywhere. But anyway, so that's the area of my mom's life where she's so generous with people. Like she's, she brings so much life. Like she's the person she's hyping you up. Oh, I love your dress. I love your outfit. Like, where are you from? Oh, that's so cool. She's hyping people up everywhere. So she's so generous about it. And I'm like, we all have our versions of that. Like it's different for each of us, but I I truly believe that we all have our versions of that. Oh my gosh. It's so beautiful. My, my, one of my best friends just sent me a, a TikTok reel, which is so cute. And it's so cool. I'll have to find it and post it. And it was talking about how you remember the Care Bears used to do the Care Bear stare. Yeah. And this woman was like, this is actually real. And she was showing how, like, when you open your heart, there's a certain oh. photons that get released. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's amazing. She showed the science behind like open-hearted, oh loving generosity. Oh. And I was just like eating it up. Like, that- and and then, she, amazing. and then she showed the science behind when they would do it all together and how like when a group of people opens their heart. The reason I say this is because, and I, I it touches me so much that you, you shared that about my podcast, but you know, similarly, people are like, how do you have 30 million downloads in five years? And I didn't even start, I had nothing when I started, no Instagram, didn't even have an account, had nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> my team, Colleen and I laugh because for the first like two years of the podcast, I didn't have like an opt-in. Like I didn't have a get on my email list. Like I didn't know what I was doing in that regard. I just knew I had to make this thing. Like Mm. I just knew that like, I just had to do this. Like I wanted to help. I thought there might be somebody like me who was like wanting to feel seen and expressed. And I didn't want them to feel like there were no possibilities for them to be themselves. And so I think that there is something so powerful about realizing, like you said before, it's one person at a time. And the second thing being this generous heart, like when you're Mm. in this overflow, as you said so beautifully, and you're generous, you never even have to worry about your own stuff. It's incredible, Mm -hmm. right? How many people then just like show up without you having to pull or try or grasp. It's incredible. It really is. I, oh, I love that. I, I need to see that real. I gotta say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, that is the illustration. That's it. That's it. 100%. Yeah. And that's just the thing is like, I've said this so many times and I, I love, you know, thinking about it. Like people often say, what do I need to do? And the real question is who do I need to be? Right. Mm-hmm. Cause you're being, you can feel it from Morgan. And, and another thing about you and, and guys, as I'm asking her this last question, feel free to write questions in the chat and I'll, I'll pull a few for her to, to answer. But the other thing is that when, when it comes to allowing, we talked about allowing success, you 
you've become successful, not just in having an audience that is engaged and supportive and healed by you, the money has come. Mm -hmm. You've allowed that to come in. Um, and that's also something that sometimes when, when people are, are spending their time worried about how that will happen or, mm -hmm. or upset about the fact that they already know there's no way it could happen or they don't know the how, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily move it any closer, but it seems as though when you sort of just showed up with this, like this powerful potency of mm -hmm. just giving like love and, and, and not worrying about the ROI, you were also then a match for it to come back because you were it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we don't yeah. get what we want. We get what we are. So you were abundant in that point because mm -hmm. yeah. you were able to be an overflow before you had proof of actual <laughs> currency overflow. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Cause I'm sure oh you've gosh. met people who are like yes. struggling and, and you said before the money wasn't coming in with the music, mm -hmm. but then boy, has it come in from you being in this yeah. season. Oh my goodness. So not to be that person who's like, it's in my book, but I really do write about the story in my book because it was, I was like, I want to put this here for someone else who might be in this yeah. spot. It was, I had to learn how to let go. I had to learn how to let go. And this is what it looked like for me. Once I started making the art, I started doing a little bit of freelance and then I started to get a little bit like, okay, well, here's how I want it to look like, here's, here's sort of my, my plan. Yes. Like maybe I can get this and that. But the thing with freelance that I discovered, I learned very fast is this term called net 90. That means you're not getting paid for 90 days. So I was in in the spot where I had some things coming in, but it wasn't consistent enough. And I literally remember being pregnant with my son at like seven months years old in the middle of a net 90. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like how many more days do we have until that check comes in the mail? So I was already waiting for that. And then my husband who was working in construction at the time, his boss called and said, Hey, I don't have any work for you. Don't come back until I say so. Yikes. We have a baby coming. And th just like that, like that was the main salary income in the house, just gone. And it was in that moment that I was sharing my art. It was not as big as what I'm doing now, but I was getting it out there. And I was getting like a few collaborations here and there. They were small, but they were, they were slowly coming in. They're slowly coming in. My husband looked at my Instagram and said, you know what we could do? He said, we could take some of the art that you shared and we could turn them into, he was very specific. He said, we could turn them into eight by 10 prints and we can make a Shopify store. And you know what? I looked at him and said, no, I don't want to do eight by 10 prints. I want to do big prints. I want to do, I was like, I don't want to do that. I was like, if I'm going to release a collection, it needs to be something new. It needs to be this, that, I'm like, you're not an artist. You don't know. And he's like, just let, let me try it. I was like, okay. So he went on my Instagram and he found 10 pieces and he brought them to me and he was like, can we do these 10? And I was like, no, I don't like any of those. Let me pick them. So, so I went back and then I picked the 10 or I think I may have taken some of his picks, but at the end of the day, it ended up being collaboration. He's like, all right, we're going to order. And I, I want to say we spent like no more than a hundred dollars. Like, cause we did not have, like, we did not have money. And he ordered the prints and I did not like, I did not like the process the whole time. Like, I was just like, this is not how I want to share my arts. This is not how I want to do it. We sold out immediately. We bought more. We sold out again. We added stickers, sold out immediately. We had like literally 24, 48 hours, 72 hours sellouts for like two three, four weeks, just like, boom, 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 selling out, selling out to the point that he did not have to go back to his job. We were able to get full coverage health insurance, which we did not have at that point. And everything changed. And that was the most humbling, wow. humbling, rewarding experience I've had in my whole life. Like Morgan, you're not a business person. You're not, you got some business ideas, but you need somebody else who's not the artist to come in that you can trust and say, hey, I don't know, it's an idea, it may work. And you know what? After that point, we tried apparel and it didn't work, but it's okay because we tried journals after that and they work. So it's like, it's not like, okay, every time you let go, it's gonna be amazing. But I've, I've had to learn how to stay in a posture of being open to other people's ideas. 
So everything, like everything from that moment to my Paul Mitchell collaboration, my Target collaboration, anthropology, all that stuff, other people were involved. I had to trust that there are other people who are product designers, who are marketers, who know how to carry this thing to the finish line. And I've got to focus on that part that I can do and invite other people in. And it's so hard. It doesn't, it never stops being hard because I'm like, I got ideas. I got ideas. I know, you know, I know. I got ideas. <laughs> I'm like, I got some ideas. I'm creative. I, I got a strategy. And sometimes I do come with strategy, but in terms of like actually bringing it through to turn it into a business, to turn it into something sustainable. Like I'll never forget when my husband was like, yeah, so I'm, I'm interviewing right now trying to find an accountant. I'm like, we need an accountant. Are you sure? Like we need like a full-time accountant. And he meets with our accountant once a week. Once wow. a week. I'm like, wow. Why? But at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to just trust you on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes like I'm a part of the meetings as well. Um, but it's, it's hard because there's so many facets to it. But I, I think that, you know, if I had to give someone advice or encouragement, it's just like, you can start small, just notice where you can let go, even just a little bit, like, a little bit, just let go and then slowly grow from there. You know, pay attention to your body, listen to your gut, find people you can trust. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that's, that oh is gosh. how I think it's come to life. <laughs> it's such a, that's such a powerful lesson. I think everybody needs to hear that once a day, um, because it is incredible how we, you know, we have such a limited view, like from our coordinate of latitude and longitude based on what we've already seen, yeah. based on what we know. And it's like, it can happen in so many ways that you can't predict Exactly. if you could just let go and stop trying to drive Mm -hmm. the car, like allow it to be easy. Let it be easy. Let it just come to you. Right. And Mm -hmm. it also is like, try stuff. Right. And the clarity comes through just like trying it. The Mm -hmm. clothes didn't work. The journals did, but the clothes worked at Splendid. The clothes worked at, you know, (laughs) anyways. Exactly. um, Cause there's, that's like, there's a whole there's a whole industry of people who study clothing and all, you know, all that. And we didn't know that. So yeah, it was okay. I love that. Yeah. It ended up being so full circle. Yes. All right. The chat was moving very quickly. (laughs) Uh, People have a lot of questions. I'm going to ask you a few questions really quickly. So one question, I just think this is a good one because it feels very universal is how do you handle any kind of self-doubt or criticism that you might get from other people? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, I'm very sensitive and, you know, stuff gets to me. And I've had people say things like, when are you going to stop saying the same thing over and over again? And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I being repetitive? Like what? And I'll, and I'll question myself, do I need to be more this or do I need to be more that? Or, you know, I'll compare myself to other people who are sharing. I've, I've dealt with tons of being ripped off. Oh my goodness. Like that's a whole separate conversation of my God. dealing with that. Um, but it's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. I, I try to, to counter that with tons of inspiration. And what I mean by inspiration is what I mean. It's, it's like the, another word for inhalation. So a lot of times we think of inspiration as like stuff we put out, but it's like inspiration is actually another word for inhalation. So I try to take in, inhale good things, mm. listen to good podcasts, listen to the audiobooks that were of people who have been through way more than I've been through and to just be encouraged by their stories I try to, to listen to encouraging music, do things that, that ground me. So that is how I counter that. Cause I, I recognize I'm like, that's going to come. Someone's going to leave a one-star review. Like just go ahead and expect it. Just go ahead and expect it, that you're going to have a customer who's just more difficult than others in terms of how to deal with them. And they're just, they're just like, no, I'm going to make this miserable for you. <laughs> like every yeah. now and then, thankfully yeah. I don't have a ton of that, but it's like, yeah, these moments come where it's, it's people or, or, and a lot of it could just be stuff that's going on and in that in the, you can't control. So just expect that that's going to happen, but know that what you can control is you can counter that with your inspiration. So one of my favorite artists is Karita Kent. I love her so much. Uh, she's no longer here. I never got to meet her. Um, but there, and there was never, she's not like, she never had like a big documentary about her, but there's YouTube videos of her. So I have like a inspiration playlist on YouTube. And a lot of times when I'm working or I'll clean up the house, I'll just turn on the Karita Kent documentary because Karita Kent was a, a pop artist, social activist, nun. 
and uh, college educator as well. And she did some incre incredible artwork. But during the time that she was doing that, there was a very um, kind of like a strict I guess I, I, I'm like beginning some of the Catholic terminology wrong here, but I think there was like a very strict bishop that was like really hard on her and like trying to suppress her mm -hmm. and just hearing about how she, other people in her life were talking about how she persisted through that and how she didn't stop talking about justice. And this is in the sixties and seventies. And she just kept talking about the importance of, 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 of looking after black lives and all this. And I'm just like, yeah, I just have to, I have to just stay in that zone. So that's how I deal with that. I just increase the input, the positive input all the time. That's such a beautiful way to, to see it and so empowering. Um, okay. Last question for you as we're wrapping up is yeah. your podcast, the Morgan Harper Nichols show. I've been loving it. It's gorgeous. Oh, thank the you. Conversation, just the, the daily nuggets, like finding meaning. Um, and I've heard you on other people's podcasts since you've now been more in the podcasting space, which is really cool. Tell us why, um, you love the podcast and where we can find it. Yeah, so I love being able to do the podcasts because it's just a way that I I love to, I personally love to listen to podcasts and I love audiobooks. So my podcast is a Monday through Friday short episode. So I read a lot of like what Amazing. you would see on social media. So if you just want to maybe reflect on it a little bit more and, you know, instead of just kind of scrolling through, that's what I made it for. I made it for the person who, you know, maybe just why are you getting ready in the morning? You just want to hear something that that is encouraging or to just help you take a deep breath. I just wanted to, to create a a safe space for people to come and have that moment. So I just love being able to offer that. And, and yeah, it's Monday, Monday through Fridays, the Morgan Harper Nickel show. <laughs> it's incredible. And if you guys want to buy any of her, she has prints, journals, greeting cards, stickers, stationery, planners. You can go to the garden 24 store. Yes. Um, everything is beautiful. Like when in doubt, if you need a, a gift for a friend, you'll you'll be the one that they go, I oh, love this, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so tell us, uh, as you just put the links to your podcast and your Instagram and your website in the chat, um, and we can post everything as well, but um, tell us where we can follow you. Your favorite place for us to follow you is where? Yes, yeah, so I would say, you know, right now I would say Instagram, like I, I, I'm very active right there active there right now and also becoming more active on on Pinterest and I'm on TikTok too but it's not like I'm just kind of like an old like I'm just <laughs> you're not gonna see me doing anything really clever it's like oh it's the same stuff on our Instagram so you don't have to go over there if you want to but yeah yeah Morgan Harper Nichols Pinterest Instagram all that good stuff so yeah you're honestly the best and I would never curse you that you should have this job, but if you were ever running for president, you'd save the oh. world. That's all I'm saying. You know, I have actually told, I was like, you know what? I would run for president if I could do it over Zoom, but I'm like, there's- That is the best quote ever. Can I do that on Zoom? No, no that's okay, all that's, it. Like all the tours and oh my goodness. It's exhausting. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd be, I'd be tired forever. Yeah, yeah. I would never <laughs> wish that on you. But really, I just feel like if we can send a beam of you, you know, oh into the goodness. world, we'd be good. We would be done within like <laughs> one minute. We'd be like, got it. <laughs> Got it. Message received. Um, you are so awesome. Gorgeous inside oh, and out. Okay. Thank you for such a treasure of a conversation. Um, I hope you enjoy your little boy and your life, yes. whatever. You're probably doing something so delicious today. Like you're going to go doodle. You guys follow oh, her Instagram because sometimes <laughs> she shows you as she's just going, oh, I look do, at this color. I oh, and do. it's like, yes, yes, mesmerizing. yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, I am I am so grateful that we get to have this conversation and, and I hope that I hope we get to meet in person. Someday. I know I we haven't met, right? We talked so. about it. I was in LA <laughs> and then I came here and yes, next, we'll do it. We yes, will yes. for sure do it. I'll take you sure, to lunch. Been a pleasure. Sure. Thank Wonderful. you for coming today. Yes, and thank you to everyone as well. Everybody loves I, you. I enjoyed being here with y'all. It was so lovely. <laughs> thank you, Morgan. Thank you. God bless All you. All right. Bye. Bye, honey.